<laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, I'm very happy to be the moderator today to talk about this, um, the art of the m and deals. And um, so we are going to have uh, one hour, well, 50 minutes to be exact, uh, to talk about this. Um, we took uh, half an hour to discuss about different topics. And then uh, we have a 20 minute Q&A sessions all together. I'm very glad to introduce uh, Marie Yu. Marie is currently um, working at uh, Intuit. Um, she's working in the corporate development uh, team. And uh, she's come from um, a very international background because she has been uh, living in China, Singapore, and now she lives in the US. She also works in different um, companies and uh, environment in asset management, consulting in fintech, in bank, uh, you know, working in corporate. And um, one thing memorable I learned about uh, Mary is that um, um, never pissed her off because she's kind of uh, someone with um, a lot of determination. For example, when she, she was doing his, her MBA, she called more than 200 bankers to get her first job. So guys, never piss her off. Otherwise, your, your phone never, never, will never stop uh, ringing. Okay, and so I'm also very pleased to introduce uh, Jonathan. Jonathan Sarfati, uh, he comes from uh, uh, C for background. He has been working in uh, some uh, software industry, commerce industry, and now he's the CFO of uh, Stewart. And um, the thing memorable about Jonathan is that uh, he's kind of a X ratio lover. What's that? It's you know the guy who loves to multiply things. So when he was uh, in his engineering school, he just did uh, ten times more uh, fundraising uh, than any any year before. And now that he's at Stewart, they did like in some few years more than three hundred x ratio of growth. So that's that's amazing. So those two people are going to share stories. Um, about their background, their learnings, and we'll try to give you actionable insights uh, during this, uh, this hour with you. So uh, Jonathan, uh, can you please uh, tell us in, in a few words what uh, Stuart is doing today? Yeah, thank you, Xavier. So hi, everybody. Uh, Stuart is a last mile delivery platform. So basically, we are putting in, in relation merchant and, uh, and independent couriers, uh, a bit of a, what Uber is doing on the, on the taxi, taxi mode. We are doing the same on the delivery mode. We are uh, operating in Europe, five, 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 nearly six country, and uh, part of La Poste Group, so National Post, but we'll have time to, to, to talk about it during the next 30 minutes, uh, around 700 employees and a few hundred million uh, turnover this uh, this year thank you and marie can you do the the same game presenting uh intuit sure intuit is a public traded uh company market cap is about 150 billion we're based in mountain view um and we have some flagships uh software products one of them is quickbooks accounting for smbs and uh some another one is uh, we also have consumer finance apps such as Credit Karma, which we acquired last year for about eight billion, um, and Mint, which is another uh, financial software for consumers. And recently, we just announced the acquisition of Mailchimp for twelve billion, um, and we are on a spree of M and A. Yesterday, we announced another technology acquisition of a smaller company based in Malta. Yeah. Congrats for that. Thank you. Um, maybe, Jonathan, we can start with you. Um, can you tell us a little about, uh, because this is going to be one of the background stories we are going to use uh, today. Can you tell us the story of the, the acquisition of uh, Stuart um, by uh, GoPost and the group La Post? Yeah, like for sure. So two or three minutes. Basically, Stuart was uh, as, as, as a seed round of uh, 20 million back in 2015. This seed round has been done by, has been leaded by Geopost. So Geopost is the, the parcel part of group, uh, of group La Poste. Uh, so they have invested to take a minority stack in, in Stuart Capital. 
to Art Equity, and then one year and a one year and a half after, uh, we've been through a, a fundraising operation uh, to try to to raise more money, some kind of Serie A, Serie B. Uh, and it happens that during the negotiation and during the discussion with the funds, with the bankers, uh, it appears that finally the best solution was potentially not to raise money, but to for La Poste and Geopost to acquire the, the remaining equity. So what turns to be at the beginning, what was supposed to be a fundraising, turned into a, an acquisition by the, the minority shareholder, which is an industrial uh, industrial partner working in the, in the, in the delivery business. It was quite quick, actually. Uh, it, it, the operation last. Uh, they knew they already knew the company because they were shareholder for for uh, almost one year and a half. Uh, and uh, and the decision to move from uh, from Serie A, Serie B to to acquisition was taken su super quick, uh, mainly because of cash, uh, because we needed to to find a, a solution on on the cash side, but also because. On the, on, we, we thought that from a strategical point of view, it was the good moment to ally with an industrial partner versus a, a financial a financial one. And this happened in uh, in between February and March 2017, so more than more than four years ago. And uh, as CFO, um, we are often like afraid of you know the post merger uh, acquisition part because uh, our role are at, uh, at stake. And um, can you tell us more about the level of uh, autonomy and uh, how the post-merger is, uh, is doing now? For uh, sure. Uh, so what I used to say at, at everybody at Stuart and even outside is that the, the life, we were about 100, 100 ish at Stuart back in the days. The work of 99% of the employees at Stuart has not changed. Their, their life has not changed. The change shareholder, but because La Poste has a really decentralized approach, so they are not, you know, intrusive in the business, etc. The only person and department that has been impacted was was finance. Uh, we turned from a, from an independent company to a subsidiary of a big group. So with all the the constraints and, and happy things that, that it means in terms of, you know, monthly closing, budget, tax thing, transfer pricing, you know. All the things we are going to talk about in the in the next uh, in the in this session. So yeah, it's a, it's an industrial partner. We you have industrial synergies, but they are not that much intrusive. So they know that they, they, they assume that the business is between good ends, and that they pilot they are piloting the business through again monthly closing budget figures etc. Board meetings, but at the end of the day they uh, they didn't come with you know an army of consultants in day one to just change everything uh, but we had to adapt on the financial side for sure uh, because la poste is not a listed company but has the same constraint as a listed company so you know monthly closing half year closing yearly closing tax thing all these things we are, not, we are just about to launch a csr report so everything that is about the, the constraint of a listed company has uh, has been uh, has become a reality from uh, February to March 2017. It looks like from what you say that um, um, Stuart can be considered as a standalone acquisition uh, with quite a lot of uh, autonomy. Mm -hmm. um, maybe, Marie, with your background, um, can you tell us more about the different nature of uh, M&A uh, deals that we can find uh, other than this um, standalone acquisition? Sure, um, happy to answer that. I have personally worked on uh, various kinds of transactions. Uh, even when I was at Credit Suisse, you know, I worked on some um, PE-backed transactions. And right now I'm at Intuit working in Corp Dev, so mostly, you know, strategic buyer-backed transactions. And uh, that's one obvious differentiation. Uh, and I, I can share more the differences later. But in terms of the operations model post in a uh, post acquisition you i think Xavier you're right that steward sounds like a standalone uh, operations model uh, at uh, intuit we've done that with credit uh, with credit karma last year after our acquisition of the company they're running under their own brand with their own separate operations and we're focused on accelerating 
their growth and fueling their customer growth by cross-selling from, from our consumer finance products. Uh, I think there is also the kind of transactions where the business will be rolled up into the buyer. Uh, in the case of MailChimp, which we announced, uh, I think two weeks ago, or uh, I, I, I was, it's very near memory, so I was thinking one week, but maybe it was already two weeks. Uh, in any case, in this transaction, the integration plan would be to uh, have MailChimp join our products family and, you know, uh, basically incorporating the product features into our own. Um, so that's another model. And I'd say there is other type, there, there's another type of transaction where the motivation is mainly about talent acquisition. And that means, you know, we are not actually, actually we're shutting down the business. You know, we're, we're shutting down their sign up pages um, and their products will be discontinued, but we will, we will include the talents in our company. And we did, Intuit did some of that deals uh, previously. Sometimes they are really small, maybe a handful of million dollars, maybe it's one founder company or like two founders company. Um, and they definitely provide the expertise that the company is looking for. Obviously this, these type, you know, these transactions will only be for you know strategic buyer transactions, not for PE necessarily. I, I think. Um, yeah, so that's another you know model of post acquisition integration. So I guess in summary, there is standalone, just like uh, Stewart's case. There is technology tuck in, uh, like in the case of Mailchimp, um, and there is also the talent acquisition type. Uh, usually, they're you know, less lower profile and not ne not necessarily made known publicly. Yeah. And can you give uh, maybe not for talent acquisition because it's obvious it's regarding like uh, acquiring some talent and uh, new people, but um, can you tell us maybe some risk or opportunity when to do what uh, type of acquisition? Um, maybe to talk about asset deals or stuff oh, like yeah, this. Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, thanks for reminding me, Xavier. Uh, so in our pre-call, we talk about uh, there is actually another way to differentiate transactions, which is a stock purchase versus an asset purchase. And usually in technology, m and the asset, it can be like the IP. So the, the, the source codes, your GitLab repository. Uh, so in that kind of situation, you know, it's very uncommercial, very unconventional M&As. You know, you will have um, a clean purchase of their asset without the liabilities, without the customer contracts. So you won't own the target's customer contracts, which is, you know, what we did in the deal we just announced yesterday was a technology acquisition slash IP acquisition. Uh, we are, however, having, uh, you know, having um, some kind of, post-transaction service with the target to help us integrate their tech into our tech stacks. Yeah, um, and I'd say maybe it sounds less complex. In reality, it is not because you have to do the integration planning right away before you sign the deal. And if you're engaging them for a two year time horizon, you have to scope out your product timeline, like your roadmaps for the next two years so that people are, they're on board when they sign the contract, uh, you know, right at the close of the deal, yeah. And, and still talking um, about the different way to analyze the um, M&A, uh, M&A deals, um, there is a way which is uh, the opposite of uh, doing an M&A deal with a P company or with a strategic. Can you tell us uh, the, the, in terms of timing, in terms of valuation, what are the, the differences? Marie. Yeah, sure. And you know, I'm sure anyone who worked in investment banking would have a, would have a perfect answer to that question. It's like the typical interview question. Uh, tell us the difference between a PE versus a strategic buyer transaction. Um, so, I guess apart from the very simple answer, like valuation-wise, PE deals are usually lower valuation because 
the PE firms are focused on deriving value uh, and deriving return from the acquisition, while strategic has more uh, strategic rationale for the acquisition. So valuation is a very ob obvious one. Um, and that's what I see firsthand as well when I was working on a uh, $2 billion telecom infrastructure transaction while I was at Credit Suisse. I was on the I was on the seller side, and we engaged uh, twenty over potential buyers right at the beginning, including Strategic and P. And when we received their letter of letter of intent and their initial bids. It's quite obvious, you know, the valuation range is quite different. Um, and I'd say also maybe less obvious is that the PE firms can commit to a faster timeline with a greater level of certainty in closing the deal. Um, in, in, the, in the case of a strategic buyer, they will have to go through regulatory review once they sign the uh, definitive purchase agreement. For, exam for example, in Credit Karma case, uh, we signed in February 2020 and we closed it I, in December 2020 because uh, we had this antitrust review by the Department of Justice and eventually uh, Credit Karma had to divest their tax business because we have Intuit has a big tax business in the U.S. Combining the two of us may be considered you know, too large for the market. So there is definitely a lot more uncertainty in closing of the deal. And PE firms will come in and tell the startup or the target company, I can close the deal in 10 days. Uh, the money will be in your account in 10 days. So choose what you want. If you want that, go for it. If you want, you know, strategically, if you want your business to be doing more doing things that you personally feel more passionate about or if you care about your employees and the strategic buyer offer a very, a very good structure for your employees without cutting too many people. And if you like that better, then you know, that's another route to go after. Um, I'm sure Jonathan, you, know, you can also share more about the P and strategic buyer differences. Um, I mean, for uh, on our side, it was really a strategic deal. Uh, you know, last mile delivery is, uh, is boiling everywhere and uh, it's for the, the traditional delivery guys. It's the, the most expensive and where there are the most uh, shitty things to manage, I will say. So, you know, it's a uh, neither defensive or offensive move. It's just you need to, you have an asset, you buy the asset and you know that the asset won't be bought by, by somebody else. And then you think about the synergies and what is what is you know pretty insightful four years after joining uh, after joining Stuart is that the, the the synergy called BP built four years ago was obsolete after two months so you know there is you know the slides there is you know the there is the reality and at the end of the day you have a lot of ideas you can cross a client base you can cross uh, you can decide to merge tech you, when it comes to to find ideas dur during the MNS session creativity is limitless that the reality of the field could be could be super different and even adapting in a world where you are 100 and 200 and you work with a group of uh, the 20 or 30,000 employees you cannot put that on, on slides so it's a reality that you need to you need to live with and uh, and you need to adapt and you need to know that for example a project that for you could take five days for them it will take six months so you know, it's, uh, I think strategic by nature is, as you say, a, re a good news for the employee database. They, they think that they will be part of a project, that the project is not over and that it will continue to grow inside a corporate. Uh, but the big, big question is when you work on the synergical BP, when you work on everything and on the preparation on the, you know, the famous one plus one needs to become three or more. Uh, it's super important to, to take into consideration the culture, the, the reality of the business, etc., because uh, because it's not that easy to merge teams, to merge technology, to merge clients. It's not uh, it's not that uh, that easy. Jonathan, talking about uh, this preparation phase, can you um, define or talk more about uh, what will be the the classic roadmap, the the things not to forget uh, mm -hmm. during this preparation phase before the deal? 
So I'm a, I'm a strong, you know, believer that everything starts with accounting. And, you know, when I joined Stuart, it was a really young company uh, and uh, we are 30 and no, no, no accounts, etc. And my first main thing, and it would have been the same with or without uh, Lapos being part of the, of the round table, is you need to build a rock solid accounting. So you need to, could be in source, could be outsourced, it's a different debate, but your first thing is to build a rock solid accounting because everything that the, 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 the company will, that will acquire you, will ask you, will be based on accounting. Could be monthly closing, could be tax things, could be budget. At the end of the day, you need a, a rock solid accounting. So I think we should start from this, knowing that, you know, today, especially in Europe, you have a lot of money on the market and a lot of VC are investing on company with, you know, not even a, a, a single source, a single set of account or monthly account or whatever. And I think it's, it's pretty dangerous because, again, everything it started from, everything starts from there. Second thing that people used to underestimate and that it's becoming important, especially if you acquire by a, a multinational group, is tax and legal, and putting everything in the same, in the same umbrella. Uh, tax is a topic that is usually not super well, it's not treated when you're in a startup, when you're in a young company. It's, at, it's usually at the end of the roadmap uh, when you're part of the big group. Uh, tax is becoming uh, is becoming something that that matters. For one single reason is that the big group is uh, as a positive EBITDA normally or positive EBIT you don't have. So tax is becoming tax is something that is that is making uh, that could make a difference. And you also have you know you can also buy a company uh, because you want to buy is. Uh, is loss carried forward, so you want to buy a stock of losses to integrate to your uh, to your tax to your balance sheet uh, and and reduce your uh, your tax exposure. Uh, and legal, you know, I think everybody here know that due deal is fifty percent around legal, the documentation, etc. Uh, and on on that, uh, I, I strongly believe that from day one, uh, CFO should make sure that the, the legal documentation is up to date, ready, and that, uh, and that it, can, it can absorb and it can face a due diligence. Uh, otherwise, you create a backlog, you create a, yeah, a backlog which could rapidly become a, a poison uh, because you need to remember what happened two years ago, you need to recreate the documentation. So it's, uh, it's something on which it's super hard to do it ba backwards. Uh, compared to accounting where you can catch up two years of accounting in six months if you want, but uh, catching catch up the delay of two years of non-legal documentation is definitely a pain in the ass. And so you'd rather want to, to be ready when it happens. And last, something that we discuss uh, during, during the, the preparation and something that people who we, we live in a world where usually when you, when you work in a startup, it's your first job or your second job, but we live in a world where the startup population, they have, for majority of them, this is the case at Stuart, they have never worked in, in big groups. So there is something that they don't know is existing, is the internal control, I will say, which is the, the way you are doing your process, the tools you are using, etc., which uh, could you might think that this is something which is only for, uh, for listed companies, but not. And uh, we'll speak a bit later about what happened just after the, the acquisition. But the first thing that happened after the acquisition was a full audit of our internal process. So mm -hmm. we had to, to go through a full audit, HR, finance, uh, procurement, tech, everything. Uh, they checked everything to make sure that the fraud risk, the IT security risk, so everything was uh, was under control. So internal control, it could start with, you know, small thing, uh, double valida uh, sing validation on every payment, uh, purchase order for any purchase request, you know, could be quick wins, but it's something that is that it's making a lot of sense when you are acquired, uh, especially if you are acquired by a, by a, big, uh, by a big company. Thank you for the transition, talking about the uh, post manager, because um, I'm going to look at you, uh, Marie. Um, 
the, after this phase of preparation, there is the deal, of course, and we maybe have the, some questions on the Q&A, but especially the deal. But talking about the post-merger, um, what would be the, the key factor of success? Because you have seen a lot of uh, post-merger acquisitions, leading some of them. Uh, so can you structure the, the important phases and uh, takeaways of this, uh, of this part? Sure. And I'd also like to add on to what Jonathan shared about the preparation, maybe just a few uh, additional points. Uh, I think the security front is quite important in your preparation because uh, if you're selling to a strategic like ours, like Intuit, uh, security and customer data privacy concerns are very important. Um, actually, I've gone through a process with a company that failed our security pen test three times. That's very, very uncommon. Usually it's done the first time, but that particular company failed three times. Fortunately, we did not lose patience with them. Uh, we did the fourth time and they were successful. So I think it's quite important to you know, ensure your security is all right, you have the right protocols and you also have the right uh, security resource on your team. Um, so because that will, because to a large company like ours, that's like the most important, we cannot, we cannot do that if this is not met. Um, and I also just one last piece of advice for preparation, which is to get a really good lawyer, uh, especially if you're considering unconventional deal structure, like an IP purchase, or if, a, if it's a cross-border deal. Yeah. Um, and in terms of the post acquisition integration, actually, I think Jonathan Jonathan can share more. Uh, I'm sure, but from my own personal background and experience, um, I'd say we see success if the target company has a very strong buy in even before we sign the definitive purchase agreement. Uh, into it as a strategic buyer, we like to develop alignment in our vision and mission. Um, and we usually do, uh, and, and like this is not just for Intuit, but usually you do an integration plan, uh, you know, to assess the, the potential of the business to make your financial model. Um, sometimes it's made from the buyer, if it's a P, um, sometimes it's co developed with the target, if, especially if you're in an exclusivity period with the, with the target company. So that's quite important to know okay, this is from the startup or the target perspective, this is our plan. This is where we think you can come in. And the buy-in right at the gate is very important for the post-integration, um, you know, sorry, the post-acquisition. Um, if you do not have the same expectations, say, if you say you wanna be standalone and you don't define what is standalone, do you have separate systems? Do you have different sales teams? then it's really hard to accelerate that process post um, the post the acquisition. And I'd also say in a in an IP purchase slash a you know the asset purchase, uh, as I mentioned, you need to scope out the two years um, or however long that you have together with the target company. And so it's very cross-functional um, and you need a good program manager to manage that process. Um, and I think, I think Jonathan may be able to share from the startup, the target perspective, but my perspective is obviously from the buyer. Um, so there is gonna be a lot of reporting, you know, scorecards um, and program management across time zones. Um, and there may be, direct reporting and daddy reporting to different departments and within the old company's management and the new company's management. Um, regarding the, the time we have left uh, for this, this part of um, discussion, um, maybe a, a question for you, Jonathan, if you will be able to, to talk to yourself uh, four years before, sorry for the noise in the background, and uh, there's kids at home. Uh, um, what will you recommend yourself to do differently? So I think I will um, 
I think we have been well prepared, you know, having the, the, the La Poste as a minority shareholder uh, before the deal has, has made us on, has, has put us on a good path to be, to be prepared for the deal and then for what, is, what was going to happen after. Uh, I, I will say that when, I will say that at the end of the day, something that I strongly believe is that the, the company that is acquiring you, if it's bigger than you, and if this is a listed company or this kind of thing, it's where you want to be. It's, uh, you, you are a startup, you are a scale up, you are doing things in a way, but at the end of the day, you want to be structured, mature, etc. The same as the company with, which is, which is acquiring, acquiring you, sorry. And, For that to be ready, you need to take super seriously uh, the advice that these people will give you in terms of, you know, tax structuring, internal control, budgeting, etc. At the beginning, you might say, you know, we have been acquired in March and in May, we've been through our first budget exercise for the year after. And we were saying the guys, guys, we are in May 2017, you are asking us the budget of 2018. We are not ready at all. We don't even know what is going to happen next week. So start asking us what is going to happen in, in nine months from now. But so I was not taking that that much seriously. We did the exercise because we had to do it, but it was not taken that was not done that, that seriously enough, I think. So you need to take the advice seriously, as you know, as a, the, the big brother giving advice to his uh, the smaller sister or, you know, take the advice seriously. You don't need to do everything by the books. When they ask you from day one to put a double validation on all your payments, you won't be able to do it because you won't have the workforce to do it. But keep on your mind that validation of payment is important, that if you want to grow, if they are asking you to do this, this is for a good reason. So keep, in, keep that on your mind and make sure that every piece of advice that could be a constraint, it could not be an advice, could be do this or could be if I were you, I will do this this way. Keep, take it seriously. Uh, you need to manage your roadmap after, but take it seriously and make sure that you are not laughing when your shareholder is asking you to do something that you might consider stupid, but that will be a game changer when you move from 100 employees to, to 700 as we are as we are today. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, Mary, you have been working with uh, a lot of CFOs uh, for the last uh, six years doing deals. Uh, what, what will be your, your best advice to uh, CFOs uh, which are going to do deals? Sure. Um, actually, in my past um, experience, I've also worked in VC. Uh, I did some VC investments. Uh, myself is a like Android investor, and right now I'm working on Intuit, which also we have a, a venture arms, uh, sorry, ventures arm as well. So I think from uh, as a startup CFO. You know, it, it's important to keep an open mind when you engage with a corporate. What are you looking for? Maybe it's not this acquisition right away. You know, it can be a corporate VC venture capital investment. Um, uh, and these investment may not be acquisition driven at the beginning, but that can be a start of a relationship um, which can turn into a partnership in the future or a potential acquisition. Um, and actually, pursuing a, uh, a commercial business partnership can be a good way to, you know, assess the cultural fit, assess the mission, vision, if you're aligned, and potentially, you know, that may become an acquisition. Even in Mailchimp, we we had a partner evaluation uh, previously. Um, so I think, you know, keep an open mind and build relationships with the buyer, uh, some potential buyers not you know, don't think of them as buyers but think of them as you know getting some advice or uh you know see if there's a business opportunity yeah thank you thank you very much both of you uh, jonathan and mary uh, for this uh, discussion sessions um now we're going to enter the, the q a phase we have uh, some questions um maybe we can start with um uh, one question which is from uh, Mathieu. Uh, is keeping uh, maybe but yeah is keeping some sort of an autonomy and illusion for an uh, acquired company so you, you so i will start i will reassure mm -hmm. mathieu to, to yeah. right now no it's not an illusion as i told you uh you have different kind of of 
buyers. Uh, and you know, in the, I, I can, I have two examples in mind. One was a failure, and one was a success. And I, Stuart is part of the success, not the failure. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, wh what you should keep in mind is that a smart, a, a smart uh, buyer will will know for yeah. sure that the founders, the senior management team, etc. They know the business better than 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 he does. They know better than, better than they do. So they they should trust your ability to run the business. And the positive thing that we, that I have seen since Stuart has joined uh, La Post Group is that they let us pilot the business, but they put an extra constraint on top of every decision making, which is an healthy one, especially for a CFO is they put figures everywhere. So they are asking us in the decision making process to be figures driven, ROI driven, uh, capex driven, you know, work on the balance sheet, one on, you know, they, they force us to take every opportunity and attack and tackle this opportunity through the angle of what, it is, what is the cost, what is the return on investment, etc. So my, the answer will be, no, you can stay autonomous, but for sure, your ways of taking decision uh, will be a bit impacted because it's also the board, you know, the governance will change. Uh, but I think it's for the best. And what I've seen at Stuart is that we used to take decision based on, you know, an intuition or, you know, based on, on, a, on, a, on a meeting with a guy who say, okay, we need to go in that business, etc. Uh, today it's more okay. There is the market, the addressable market is that, the market, uh, the time to market is this, the ROI is this, and it's a uh, healthier, I think, uh, way of of taking uh, of taking decisions. Thank you. And and we are talking about standalone uh, MA, huh? so <laughs> you are the best case in a sense yeah. of uh, of uh, being uh, keep more of keeping the autonomy, being yeah. able to keep the autonomy. Okay, another question I'd like to, to talk about um, from Andreas. Um, how do you target uh, optimal m and candidates firm uh, to complement your business? Um, maybe, uh, Marie, you can start to answer this question and, and Jonathan, jump on it if you, if you like. Sure, I can take this one. I'd say um, as a strategic buyer, uh, we, the business, the business units, usually they have their own strategic goals in the next, say, two year or like the next one year or five year, uh, like in that uh, range. So usually we start off the year with uh, some target, some desired capabilities that we will, that we would like for different business units. Um, and we will have a build by or partnership strategy for each of the different you know, desired capabilities. Um, and if we think something is a core, is it like a core capability and we don't want to rent a capability and we would like to own the capability, then we would usually uh, do a market scan. So it's a lot of times very uh, the like thesis driven. Um, and then in that market gap, you in that market landscape, sorry, la landscape review, um, you have companies in some similar space, and we will conduct outreach. A lot sometimes it's also inbounds, um, and you will assess the culture, the team, uh, the technology, whether they can be, where, where whether their tech can be, you know, uh, incorporated into our system, whether. Mm -hmm. Te Technology-wise, uh, they are compatible to us, uh, and different companies have different priorities. I'd say, uh, maybe for someone that is still a hyper growth stage company, having another company that will enlarge their time or total addressable market is more important than having a good technology that is compatible. Like they're willing to spend the time and the efforts to integrate the tech. If if the company the business makes sense to them, but for someone uh, for someone else maybe the tech is really important. They want to make have a really good tech standards. Um, 
so I, I say different companies will have different uh, criteria to select the optimal target for themselves. Yeah. Thank you. Jonathan, you want to add something or we... I mean, we... You know, we are we are doing also some some small M&A deal at, at Stuart and we have done some some acquisition. The main part of the acquisition we have done were in the talent acquisition category that Mary mentioned at the beginning of the of the of the conference. So, you know, you used to work with somebody or, you know, tech agency or beginning of the of the etc. You get a good fit with the with the team, etc. And you you strike a deal usually with an earn out because you also want to incentivize them to to stay and to and to continue to produce so i will say that at our scale of you know small company acquire or even smaller company uh, it's it's all about uh, it's all about the opportunity is you have an opportunity you take it or leave it but uh, you you leverage on the fact that you are faster than the big guys uh, and so that you can uh, you can move faster and you can sell a story uh, that is uh, that is sexy for for this uh, for for this uh, for these guys or girls creating company and you say okay I can support the next step uh, with you and we can create a, a super uh, a super good thing we can create super good things together. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to take another uh, question uh, from uh, Archie, which is. Uh, the three books that uh, you recommend us to read. And uh, I'd like to take this question because I want to suggest one, one book from uh, my, my experience, which was uh, The Culture Map. When I did a uh, uh, mini deal with uh, Adobe, selling our company to the Adobe group, um, it was with um, American. And I, I read this book, The Culture Map, and it helped me a lot to understand the, the cultural differences uh, uh, between uh, French people who are very direct negative feedback and a uh, US person which always put a lot of emphasis of you are amazing, it's beautiful, but there is a tiny stuff in the contract I want you to review, but it's not very important. And, and reading this book helped me a lot to understand what was really important in the negotiation due to cultural differences. So I will quite recommend you to, to read this book. I will put in in the in the chat the the, the name of it and uh, Mary Jonathan if you have any book you want to recommend uh, or you that helped you during your deals or experiences go ahead Mary uh, very interesting recommendation Xavier because I was gonna recommend a negotiation book as well. <laughs> Uh, and the book I was going to recommend is Negotiate Like Your Life Depends on It. Uh, this book is by an ex-FBI -FBI negotiator called Chris Voss. Um, I think as a, you know, as a startup or a company that is considering to be acquired, negotiation is quite important, in, in, especially in terms of the valuation that you are getting and how you are doing the integration you know after acquisition so all these ne uh, negotiations um and i think having that perspective is quite important yeah. so i uh, to be honest i don't i don't read books for work i read books for pleasure so i can recommend you a lot of books but which are more on the personal side of of, of thing uh what, what i what i will say is that you know, the, the cultural thing that Xavier mentioned is making a lot of sense and even inside a country. When you're in La Poste, you don't think the same way as you, you think in Stuart. So, you know, cultural approach is cross-border, but in, even inside a country, uh, you have different culture, different background, different ways of doing business. So you need to be prepared to, to discuss. And what has shocked me the most since we have been acquired and that is uh, is the the notion of time. Is we used to work in a world where we used to work in a world where everybody is going, everything is going super fast, especially in the delivery space where you know it's on demand, last mile. It's, it's re real time business, I will say. During an acquisition or after an acquisition, be ready to face people 
uh, who have the time, basically. So they are not in a hurry, they have the time. And uh, if they don't answer to your email after 24 hours, uh, don't panic. It's just that they, they will answer, but not today. So, you know, having a sense and an idea of the, the cultural difference between the target and the, and the, and the, the buyer uh, is also something that you want to, even if, if, even if they are coming from the same country, uh, that, could, that could matter ultimately in, uh, in this kind of M&A discussion. Thank you. And I put also in the chat another book, which is uh, Getting to Yes, which is the um, negotiation methodology of uh, Harvard Business School. And uh, it's a very, very good one. And I, I'm kind of a book addict. So if you, are, you, you need any book for any subject, you, you can contact me directly on, uh, uh, on LinkedIn or whatever. I always have a, a book for you uh, and always a place to share an uh, insight on this. I'd like to put um, maybe the last question, depending on the time we have, from um, we tell four people vote for it. It's a question for you, Jonathan. Uh, are any relevant lessons learned uh, from your due diligence? Uh, negotiation suggests that you can share with us. Yeah, I think uh, you know, it's uh, it's uh, you know we used to be super transparent. So I, I don't know. I have not done a lot of deals, so maybe people might hide some stuff, etc. The decision that we have taken during the the, the due diligence uh, was open books, uh, and uh, we used to be super uh, super transparent, etc., and not to to hide anything. Uh, you know, because of a lot of, you know, we had an earn out also, so we didn't want to create, a, a, you know, for bad, bad atmosphere from, from day one. Uh, so my, my personal recommendation would be to, to, to play on, on transparency. And then something that could sound cliche, but that is making sense is uh, you need to be, a, you need to be ready to answer to any kind of question and you, you, you are the CFO in this period of time, uh, you are the entry door. Usually the founder is, or the CEO is conflicted or working on something else or will play the good cop role while you will play the bad cop role. So he needs to be protected. He or she needs to be protected. Uh, so your job is be able to answer to any kind of question could be legal, could be finance, could be product, could be whatever. And even sometimes, and this is what happened with Stuart acquisition, you are the only one who is aware of what is happening. Uh, apart from the CEO, uh, the rest of the C-level, they were not aware. So the CTO was not aware. So they had some question on the tech. Uh, I had to manage the question on the tech and I had no other choice uh, because the, I was the only C-level aware of the, of the discussion. So transparency, adapt yourself, be able to answer to any kind of question. And uh, as Marie said, the, the, a good lawyer will do the rest. <laughs> Marie, you want to add something on this? Or we continue well, I totally on? agree. I totally agree with Jonathan that uh, you need to be ready to answer any questions. But uh, I guess just a very insider tip that I would share with the CFOs is it's on the buyer to ask you the right questions. <laughs> so <laughs> I guess it's uh, yeah, and then it's up to you how to answer them. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, both of you. Uh, Thank you everybody for uh, listening to this um, to this uh, discussion around the M&A deals, and um, I hope that you get some uh, insight, takeaway, and uh, we are pleased to to chit chat. On uh, I think there is a um, a saloon after if some uh, uh, some of you want to to stay and discuss a little, and uh, so yeah. Thank you very thank much. You, Xavier for moderating this. Thank you everyone for joining. And, and thank you, Marie, and thank you everybody for, for joining. See you. See you. See you.